This episode is all about rehousing. We are taking you along on the journey to rehouse our Canon FD dream set. We are going to take the mystery out of that process and give you super valuable tips and tricks about judging, treating, cleaning and working with vintage lenses. If you love vintage lenses, you know that they are not suited for professional film productions. For many reasons. Uh, yeah. That is it. Call my dealer. My man, just watch your FD episode. You want to come rehouse that glass? You bet your sweet ass I want to. Get your ass on a plane and come to China. Almost there. Oi! Nicholas, you big bald fuck. Let's rehouse that glass. Yes, we flew to China. This will give you the chance to see step by step what happens in a rehousing process. And there's so much to learn here. If you plan to rehouse your vintage lenses or if you're interested in optics and filmmaking in general. We are going to give you a crash course in evaluating vintage lenses with examples from haze to cleaning marks to fungus to misalignments of elements. We show you the mesmerizing process of the machining, the assembly, the measuring, marking, engraving, painting and testing of our Canon FD set, including a brand new super speed focal length. We also had the chance to compare our FDs with the real K35 set to do a bit of myth busting. So get some popcorn, strap in and let's head out to GL Optics in China. Hello and welcome to the media division. Let's start by taking one step back. I know, when you're a professional, you already know why you rehouse lenses and which ones you're going to rehouse. But as we like to take everybody along, let's go back to the basics. I think there's so much good information here that it's even interesting for advanced users. Let's start with why one would rehouse a lens and which are the ones you should rehouse. If you have been around this channel, you know that we have a love for vintage lenses. In a world of clean and sterile digital sensors and lenses that are built to be invisible, vintage lenses are a great way to breathe some soul into your images. They can introduce uncertainty and surprise to the magic sauce that is your cinematography. Something that can make an image interesting for your audience as well as for yourself. Rehousing is the way to make your beloved lens set usable in a more professional context. And of course, this will increase their value. And I mean that in, uh, in terms of money and usability. Actually, I have never ever seen a serious production deal with things like cinnamonid lenses, uh, unless they absolutely had to. Obviously, a rehousing will give better mechanics that are more durable and suitable for professional applications. PL or LPL mounts, accurate hard stops with a precise flange, a long and smooth focus throw, professional gearing, accurate markings, internal focus and zoom, unified sizes for matte boxes and more. Of course, rehousing benefits a lens beyond practical things. Many rehousers offer to replace the original iris with a modern alternative because you desire a rounder bokeh than the original iris provides. More about this later. The optical axis of a lens can be adjusted so images don't jump during focus pulls, which focus photo lenses tend to do. And of course, there are things like haze, dust, internal reflections and oil marks that can only be cleaned when a lens is completely disassembled and parts are replaced. Rehousing doesn't change the optical design of a lens. A lens that is not corrected for breathing by design will breathe after rehousing, but hand collimating can reduce it in some cases. As mentioned in the intro, GL Optics does offer modifications to optical designs to be able to offer wider focal length in an otherwise incomplete or inconsistent set. More about that later. 
to produce a high quality housing of a cine lens is generally very complex and therefore expensive. Manufacturers of new lenses have the great advantage that they can produce larger numbers. Assembly lines, standardization and division of labor reduces the cost. Rehousing vintage lenses is very different. There are a lot of different brands, lens types and variations even with specific lenses that look identical on the outside. Companies require cut designers and a lot of expertise to even plan a rehousing, especially a good one. While rehousers usually work with the housing system on the outside, the guts are very different depending on the brand and type of the donor lens. Every lens brand, focal length and version has its very unique design and requires individual parts. It is kind of a three-dimensional puzzle. Usually, manufacturers don't rehouse a specific lens in bulk, so they have to be manufactured and assembled one by one. Mechanical parts need extremely precise machining so lenses operate smoothly. This can only be achieved with high-end manufacturing and measuring techniques. All this means that everything has to be done by skilled personnel and by hand, except for CNC machining. With more variations of lenses a manufacturer's offer to rehouse, the more complex the whole game becomes. From this perspective, the price of rehousing is quite reasonable. Contemplating the cost of many thousand dollars for rehousing, only the most interesting lenses and only the finest specimen of those lenses should be considered. Mass-produced lenses that doesn't have interesting specs or stories are not likely to be a hit on set or in your rental house. What lenses will be popular in the future? What prices go up and what prices go down? Nobody knows. It's a bit like fine wine or watches or classic cars. A Toyota Corolla won't go up in price. A classic Porsche might go up, but it might go also down. If you always knew, it would be like the license to print money, right? A certain exclusivity and low numbers, just like with a classic Porsche, is a good basis, but not a guarantee. Traits that make a lens special can be things like thoriated glass, as they are illegal to manufacture since the 80s, or unusual high lens speeds a relationship to unobtainable lenses. Or maybe they have been used to shoot a famous movie. You get the gist. Hi, Lloyd. A good story okay, yeah. sparks interest in a lens set and can be the beginning yeah. of a great personal story. Are you grouchy that I made you type 10,000 flyers to help us? From a cinematographer's point of view, there is little use in a single focal length. So rehousing a usable set is the way to go unless you have a really rare or otherwise desirable lens or oh, so good. maybe a zoom. A lens that is suitable for rehousing is usually referred to as a donor lens. The donor lens's glass and coating should be in good condition, relatively. We will later explore possible damages and how to spot them. As far as we researched, only GL Optics offers to source the donor lenses for a wider range of lenses for a surprisingly modest up margin. That also means that you can have them fill empty spots in your set if you don't have the nerves or time to source a rare focal length yourself. With our legendary cine lenses on a budget episodes, we explored the contact size as a surrogate for the size super speeds. The Mamiya 645 for their unique look and usage in Christopher Nolan films and the Canon FD and their relationship to the Canon K35. We decided to rehouse our beloved Canon FD SSC spherical dream set. Since the move of Ari and Sony to full-frame cinecams, the Canon FD have hit astronomical value as their K35 cine siblings became the most expensive serial lenses ever, new or vintage. The FD spherical produce a look that is virtually identical to the K35 and some focal length use thoriated elements. Their market value, story, limited numbers and the unique images they produce make them fantastic candidates for rehousing. Unlike the K35, the FD lineup never had a high-speed 35mm lens. As this is a key focal length, one either has to live with the available 35mm f2 or substitute with alternatives. 
GL Optics offers a third possibility that allows you to stay within the FD range and still have a T1.3 35mm. How does that work? They modify an NFD 50mm f1.2 with a large wide angle adapter. We are intrigued. Of course, GL Optics can also rehouse the f2, but as this is a unique service, a good story, and we really want to see how the wide angle modification works, we opted for this offer. We will show you later how well that works. The usual suspects for individual rehousing services are True Lens Service or short TLS in the UK, Zero Optics in the USA, White Point Optics in Finland, and GL Optics with headquarters in China and offices in important markets. All of them offer advanced rehousing based on long term experience, but price, waiting list, and payment options vary significantly. There is also a newcomer worth mentioning, and that is Iron Glass. They specialized in Soviet and Eastern German lenses. TLS, Zero and White Point had around the same price depending on the specific focal length, averaging out around 6,500 US dollars. GL Optics price is $5,000 for a FD aspherical rehousing. If lenses don't use floating elements like the aspherical stew, GL's price is reduced to $4,000. TLS has a waiting list of one and a half year. Zero Optics had the longest waiting time with over two and a half years. White Point is one and a half years. GL Optics is much faster offering two to four month deliveries. Even faster rush orders are negotiable. Deposits vary a bit about when to pay what and refundability. Generally, all services want a down payment before production starts. Only GL offers sourcing of donor lenses and a 30% deposit has to be made for the value of those. GL is going to use their Mark V housings with 110mm barrel diameter and we are going to get an iris replacement and a custom design with metal caps. Full disclaimer, GL Optics was so kind to pay for our trip and rehouse our set for free just to demonstrate the quality of their services. Lucky us, again. Uh, but you should keep in mind that a production like this costs months if you count pre-production, traveling and post. Of course, we are very thankful for the opportunity and the invitation, but that doesn't mean we can't give you our honest opinion based on our observation, our experiences and our tests. After my dealer called, I packed my lenses, some fresh underwear and boarded a flight from Occident to Orient to China. Chengdu is a major city with many districts, airports, massive traffic, you name it, a real giant. Of course, I only saw a tiny fraction of that in the time I had. Namely, the Pido district where GL Optics is located. My impressions from China were quite different to what I expected. The streets underneath the high-rise buildings can give you a little Blade Runner vibe. While Caucasians might be a common sight in cities like Shanghai and Beijing, they are completely absent here. People often give you a surprised look when you pass them. Of course you see things that are exotic to Westerners, but there are many familiar things as well and a ton of clever ideas and things that I would like to have at home too. Malls are still very much alive around here and the one my hotel was in even had an IMAX cinema, playing movies like Oppenheimer and The Marvels, besides Chinese releases of course. Chinese have no problems to read Western alphabet and numbers, they are quite common here. Shops often carry English names or even Danish, strangely very few seem to actually speak English. Besides the local businesses, you see a lot of the stores, chains and brands you're used to in the West. Coca-Cola, Ban. Chinese people seem to be very dynamic and busy, but quite friendly. Everything is very digital. Young people are vlogging in the streets, people are on their phones a lot and you pay with apps everywhere. In fact, I haven't seen a single yuan bill during my stay. The average income around here is $900 per month. But before you pity them, 
food is about a fourth of US prices and the rent of a two-bedroom apartment in one of the many skyscrapers is between $100 and $200. When was the last time you paid less than 20% of your income for rent? The traditional cuisine around here is hot pot and that is what most restaurants offer. Chicken feet are considered a delicacy. <laughs> Come on, man! But if you lust for food you're more used to, there's a lot of familiar faces. Offering interesting fusion kitchen like Kentucky Fried Chicken feet. I could talk about my experiences for hours, but this is not a travel vlog, so let's go on. GL Optics is located in an industry park inside a separate four-floor building. Here we find all necessary departments to rehouse lenses under one roof. Mr. Gu is the G and Mr. Lee is the L of GL. They founded GL Optics 13 years ago and they're still heading the company. From the management to cat design, examination, cleaning, CNC machining, metal workshops, assembly, optical measuring, laser engraving, painting and quality control right up to packing and shipping. We will visit each of those departments on our journey through the rehousing process. In total there are 63 employees working here and if you expect some kind of a sweatshop, let me readjust your perception. GL Optics is a family company in the best sense, not that it's owned or operated by one family, but that many employees are members of the same families. It felt like this gave the workplace a very nice vibe. Employees care about their work, the company and most important for you, their products. GL started rehousing with a Tokina 11-16 zoom lens and a bit later the popular Sigma f1.8 art zoom lenses. Since these days, GL has massively expanded their range, expertise and capacity. GL Optics provides rehousing for individuals as well as businesses. GL can provide very individual designs based on the same highly evolved guts. To give you an impression of the facility, come along for an access all areas tour. GL Optics is able to deliver quickly even when the demand is high because they invested heavily into their machine park. There are multiple machines of every type preventing bottlenecks and ensuring a seamless workflow. When our parts get machined, we will give you a much deeper insight on the machines in the process. Another ingredient in the quick turnaround abilities of GL is that they keep a lot of parts in storage. The sheer number of lenses and manufacturers that are rehoused here make the logistics a Herculean task. Wow. This is all for prep work. This is storage for parts that have been pre-done. It's just fantastic. Let's pay a visit to the assembly room where optics and mechanics come together. A team of lens experts use their knowledge and quite a bit of finger dexterity to give lenses a second cine life. I mean, it's such a pleasure to, to see the expert work. I mean, I do it myself, but this is not comparable. This is the way you should do it, you know. I, I learned so many things here. It's just brilliant. Indeed, a great opportunity for me to learn things that might be trivial to expert, but for somebody who's self-taught, it is priceless. Starting with the next chapter, we will share a lot of these learnings. I mean, when you walk around here, there's so much lens in every corner and so much things in development. This, for example, well, I could tell you, but I had to kill you if I did. I mean, that's one heavy, sexy beast. Awesome, if you are a Lens fan, this is just ridiculous here. By the way, following our FD rehousing, we shot in documentary style because we wanted to show you what's really happening in the process. And of course, we can't do moody lighting or haze rooms where lenses are assembled and one has to be very quick on their feet. Whenever you see footage that is orchestrated and lit, that is the work of Ma, Jonathan and Avi Cohen. They put a lot of effort into producing some great looking scenes for this episode. And there's always one. So this is the Chinese crew shooting B-roll for us and we have a great 
Chinese DP. She's awesome and she speaks English. That's very helpful. <laughs> And this is Jonathan. <laughs> you might have noticed that the B-roll was shot on vintage lenses. Well, GL has the best stuff right here. Mamiya 645. Best versus East. Fight. <laughs> Here's an initiative for the world. The Chinese do one thing really better and that is Power plugs. Can you see this thing? It has European, American, and Chinese plugs at the same time. So you can plug in everything. You don't need adapters. F great idea. Now that I got that out and this into my system, let's start the process of rehousing our glorious Canon FD set by evaluating the donor lenses. The good news is that you don't need expensive gear to evaluate a lens. A bright light source and a cell phone will just do fine. Every lens that GL Optics sources themselves or that is provided by a customer starts its journey by being examined by a specialist. Especially with vintage lenses, defects are very common and considered normal to a certain degree. Some defects can be seen without disassembly and some can only be examined by taking the lens apart. GL Optics documents the type of defect, on which element and in what position it is. Some defects are neglectable, some can be improved by cleaning and some will cause a permanent and visible reduction of image quality. But what damages exist, which are common, which can be fixed and which should lead to discarding a lens. We talk to the experts at GL Optics and are happy to give you a crash course in lens examination. So you're the proud owner of a new vintage lens and you want to tell what defects that lens has, maybe to decide if you want to keep it or send it back. This is an Olympus OM 85mm f2 and this one already has a Litax EF mount conversion. Obviously you blow away the surface dust and clean the lens with fiber cloth and alcohol. To look into the lens without disassembly, you're going to need a light source. Ideally, you use one with an adjustable arm, like an ordinary desk lamp. Shining the light from the back into the lens will light up the defects we want to examine. It's a bit tricky to get the right angle, but if you play around a bit, you immediately see when it happens. You can use a darker object or even a finger between the lens element and the light source to make tiny specks and defects more visible. It is important to always pay special attention to the edges of the glass. If you examine a zoom lens, it is important to zoom through the range as some defects only get visible at a certain zoom factor. A phone with a good camera that offers close focus and magnification helps a lot. You can magnify the image to better judge what you see. The shallow depth of field of the close focus makes it easier to discern the position of the given surface and you can document the defect by taking a photo or a video. Scratches Some scratches are obvious when a sharp object cut into the surface of an element. This is often the tool damage that can also happen inside a lens during an unprofessional service. You can not only see those scratches, but you can feel them too. The tip of your finger usually does the job, but when you play guitar and your tips are a bit leathery, you can also use your fingernail. Some common scratch marks are caused by the lens being dragged over a surface. Typically, these marks show up in the center of the front element. Scratches can be visible at high f-stops and cause flares, depending on their position. Cleaning marks are very small scratches that are predominantly circular. They are caused by particles on the lens or in the cloth while the lens is cleaned. Cleaning from the inside out and with little pressure reduces the risk of leaving marks. And of course, surface and cloth needs to be clean. Cleaning marks usually only affect the coating. When you touch the glass with your fingertip, you can't feel the scratches as they are not deep enough. Very severe cases like this example could be described as haze causing degradation of the image quality and flaring. Lens elements are often glued together in groups. These groups are not taken apart during rehousing. If the adhesive deteriorates over decades, it can cause various problems. 
separation is one of them, meaning that the bond between two lenses starts to loosen. Usually, this happens from the outside first, as humidity enters the system from the outside, but it is also possible to have separation in the center of a group, usually caused by thermic reactions. Haze can be caused by surface contaminants like water vapor trapped inside the lens. This can be easily cleaned when you open the lens. Haze can also be a fungus, but this will have specific patterns we will show in a moment. Like described before, separation can cause a haze on the edges or in the center. This sample lens is home to several little aliens. Fungus can be easily identified by its plant-like shapes. It grows inside a lens if the humidity is high over prolonged times. Fungus can be cleaned, but it also eats into the coatings over time. It is critical how long the fungus was active. Glass can have chips and cracks when it has been dropped or too much tension is applied to an element. Chips can be invisible in the image when they are off-center, but they can also cause flares. The paint inside of a lens barrel can come off due to chemical process like corrosion or mechanical damage, for example caused by tools. This example is a group that has paint defects that might cause flaring. As it is inside the group, the paint effect is likely to be chemical degradation rather than caused by tools. For rehousing, only paint effects inside a group are important as the rest is replaced. Radiation of thorium inside a lens element can cause a crystallographic defect called F-center. The glass turns more and more yellow over decades, acting like a filter. Besides the shift in color, the transmission gets reduced. Just like rust on a classic car, this is not considered a vintage characteristic. The effect is completely reversible by exposing the lens element to UV light. And no, the radiation is not dangerous to you unless you grind and eat the lens. An iris can show mechanical defects and can be affected by contaminants. This is only important if the iris is not replaced in the rehousing. Cleaning can potentially damage the iris. And this is our mystery lens. There is a circular halo on the single lens element, so there can't be separation and this is not caused by micro scratches. Honestly, we have no idea what's going on here. If you know, leave us a comment. Now, which of the defects are critical depends on many factors. Contaminations can be cleaned, radiation defects can be cured, an iris can be replaced. How severe is the defect? Where is it located? How picky is the customer? And of course, how rare is the lens? If there is no alternative, one has to be more flexible. Severe damages to the coatings are problematic. Removing and replacing a coating can damage the lens. Also, modern coatings are very different to contemporary ones. Separation has the same problem. While it's technically possible, it is complex. No rehouser offers fixing separation or coatings as far as we know. There are other problems that are related to the alignment of the elements, but to evaluate those, you have to put a lens on a projector or film a chart if you don't have access to a projector. Projectors are the ideal tool to reveal the problems and qualities of a lens from an optical point of view, except for color rendition. A lens projector works like a slide projector, but it uses the lens to be evaluated to project a test chart on the wall. The chart is not an ordinary slide, by the micro-edged metal plate. We have my Canon FD 24mm f1.4 SSC on the projector now. So Mr. Lee, we're here in the projection room. What exactly are we looking for? First, we look at the center optical quality. The projected elements reveal the resolving power and aberrations in the center, as well as distortions and fall-off over the whole field of view. We see if the optical axis is correct or not, and of course, which format is covered by the original lens. A projector can reveal if elements are misaligned, which causes optical inconsistencies between the left and right side. A rehouse lens should show the same coverage as the original and correct misalignments for optical consistency. As you can see, the image of your 24mm aspherical jumps a little during focus. This means that the elements are not perfectly centered on the optical axis, something common with vintage lenses designed for photography. We are going to fix that with our rehousing. If a lens passes the first inspection and the customer has given his green light, the lenses can be disassembled and cleaned. Mm -hmm. 
Disassembly and cleaning is straightforward, but requires tools and experience with the various types of lenses. As many lenses are very valuable and rare, the most delicate handling is required. After decades of action, a lot of lenses are warped and can be very hard to take apart. The expert completes the documentation by noting which defects were improved by the cleaning. One more interesting thing is the cleaning technique of the experts that was new to me. The expert assembled their swaps on the fly by wrapping polyester fiber around tweezers. This is better than using smaller swaps as the long fiber is less likely to contaminate the lens. This has also cleared up to me which fluids are the best to clean lenses. There are just so many different voices out there stating opposite opinions on the matter. The expert at GL use isopropanol alcohol, short IPA and acetone. Acetone can affect some very old coatings and plastic types as well as non-anodized paint. Especially the painted in markings can be affected so one has to know what they're doing and where. It is important to use chemically pure acetone and to work in a well aired environment. For you at home, IPA is the safer choice. This is a 55mm aspherical before disassembly. And this is the exoskeleton that remains, including the original iris that's going to be replaced. Side by side it is super interesting to see how small the physical iris is compared to the optical entrance pupil in the system. Also, you can clearly see the radiation damage and the reduced transmission. While all this is going on, the parts for the new housing are manufactured. It all starts with aluminum tubes. GL has a variety of workpieces in storage. The tubes are cut into more usable segments and those get inserted in a variety of lathes and CNC machines. Aluminum has great properties for lens housings as it's strong, relatively easy to process and very light. The barrels of some modern high-end lenses like the Ari Signature Primes are made from magnesium as that is stronger and a third lighter than aluminum. Magnesium has the disadvantage that it can't be anodized in this context. That makes the paint job of the barrel much weaker. Not all the metal works can be done by CNC machines and there are a lot of steps in the process that are best done with more traditional lathes, drills and milling machines, all operated by experienced metal workers. Different tools cut and drill the metal with very high precision. This machine is the twin spindle CNC lathe. It has the advantage that one unit can hand over a piece to another tool with absolute precision, allowing complex structures that would be impossible to achieve with one-arm systems. Fluids are used to cool the aluminum and the tools themselves to prevent thermal reactions. Filming these processes is very difficult, as liquids and flying shavings are contained by the doors of the machines. GL was so nice to shut down the cooling now and then, so we could film the process more clearly for you. So if you do see overheating, don't worry, this is just for demonstration.
What you see here is a Heliocam CNC that cuts the groove of a helicoid at a ludicrous micrometer precision. This is quite interesting, so let me expand a bit. To move lens groups inside the lens, for focus and for zoom, there are two different mechanical systems in use, helicoid and cam. Modern cine lenses and rehouse cine lenses can use helicoid or cam. Modern autofocus lenses use cam systems so the servos can operate faster. Cam systems can alter the rotation speed over the focus range. That means that the focus throw can be longer towards infinity and shorter on close focus. Cam systems are technically more complex to build and to service, and if the pins wear off, the focus can develop backlash. GL Optics uses the traditional helicoid system. Helicoids are simpler to design, assemble and service, but they also require very precise machining for the grooves to work smoothly, right down to the micrometer realm. Before a machine part is passed down to assembly, quality control measures the physical dimensions to ensure all values are within tolerances. This, for example, is a three coordinates measuring machine. That sounds about right. When all parts of a lens are prepared, the lens is assembled for the first time. Besides to check if all parts fit and mechanics work as desired, this is the only way to make optical measurements with the lens. We won't be able to explain to you what exactly happens with each and every step along the way of the assembly, but we still think it's very educational and even mesmerizing to watch the process. Take this as your moment of zen.
Now that a working lens is assembled, it is tested and collimated. The lens is installed on the projector to ensure that all lens elements are correctly aligned and spaced. Only if everything is in order, the lens will achieve the maximum resolving power of the design. Here we can see first improvements to the original lens. This is a collimator. It measures the correct flange distance optically. A cine lens should have the infinity focus at the hard stop of the barrel. The mount has to be shimmed accordingly. This can take a couple of repetitions to get it right. All the following measurements will only be correct if the flange is spot on. We opted to have the iris replaced with a new one. The legendary K35 have a high blade count with curved blades causing a perfectly round bokeh, while the FD have the typical photo lens iris of the time using eight blades that causes octagonal bokeh. As we are going for a faux K35 set using the SSC Aspherical FD, we naturally opted for the iris replacement. Surprisingly, the new iris comes in parts and has to be assembled by hand, blade for blade for blade. The new iris has 15 curved blades that offer nice round bokeh, just like the iris of the original K35. I always thought that measurements for T-stops and distant marks are made once with a prototype and then applied to all future production lenses. This is not the way it's done at GL. Every single lens is measured and marked for everything individually. This is a T-stop machine. A T-stop is a F-stop with compensation for transmission loss. A sensor measures the lumen transmitted through the center of the lens and determines an accurate T-stop. The expert is marking the correct T-stops on the aperture ring with a felt pen. The system measures to the third decimal place. This precision is practically not required. The turn of the aperture ring would be much less than the width of the marking, so don't worry if the displayed value is rounded for the markings. This is distance measuring equipment. The expert is marking the correct focus points for each given distance with a felt pen, in feet or in meters depending on the customer's wish to use imperial or metric systems. We opted for the imperial system. A diopter allows to measure longer distances up to infinity on a relatively short system. And by the way, GL can provide interchangeable scales on customer's request. Due to our shooting schedule, our dream set had to be rehoused in record time. GL made the impossible possible. This meant that all the lenses of the set were assembled at the same time, side by side. And this is the mysterious 35mm T1.3. Well, it's still a 50mm at this time, but you can see the large lens element on the side. That is the wide angle adapter that will turn the 50mm into a 35mm. If there were doubts if the wide angle adapter preserves the lens speed, here is the new 35mm on the T-stop machine, and indeed, it clocks in at T1.3. When all markings are in place, the lenses go to the engraving department. Engraving is done using lasers, and you can imagine that it takes quite a strong laser to etch solid aluminum. You better don't put your hand under this one. The customer can choose the design of his lens markings himself with the help of GL Optics. Fonts, logos, position, orientation, size, colors, everything can be custom designed. Or you can choose from a proposal by the GL Art Department. We made our custom black hole design fitting our specific set perfectly with a Canon FD logo that is only partly painted in. This is going to look awesome. Accuracy is paramount and engravings are permanent, so all markings and logos are tested on workpieces first. Each marking for focus distance and T-stop is engraved individually with the laser engraver being adjusted manually. 
If you have ordered the beautiful aluminum caps instead of the rubber caps, they are engraved with your personal design too. If you buy a Porsche, you want the good rims too, right? After completion of the engravings, the parts go to the anodizing. After anodizing, the markings can be painted in. As said before, the customer can choose the colors he prefers. Of course, only to the extent as paints are available. This is another one of those manufacturing techniques that will give you a whole new appreciation after you have witnessed the process. Every number, every mark, every letter is painted in manually with a syringe type of tool. Color is released from the syringe when the pedal is pressed. At this stage, the paint doesn't look like in the final result. It looks kind of crude, but that is temporal. While the paint dries, the surface tension reduces and the fluid flows into the details of the engraving, with surprising details. As we mentioned, we are not going to paint in the Canon logo, just leaving a black relief as an individual design choice. paint is baked in using an oven, making it hard and permanent. Drying can cause tiny cracks in the paint and every number, mark and letter is checked after baking. If there are any flaws, they are mended and the baking is repeated until the paint job is perfect. All parts are ready for the final assembly now. All lenses are tested one more time for their mechanical functions, flange distance and all marks are reconfirmed to be correct after the assembly. All lenses are once more installed on the projector for a final check. Do you remember how the image of my 24 spherical used to jump before rehousing? Here it is after the rehousing. The lens elements are now perfectly aligned along the optical axis and the image doesn't jump on focus pulls. Wonderful. The rehousing is now completed and what beauties they are. A perfect example for excellent craftsmanship, innovation 
and determination. All lenses are photographed to ensure that potential future orders will match the existing lenses for a perfect set. If you are not in Chengdu for a pickup, GL has a shipping department that makes sure that your precious lenses travel in the safest way possible. Lenses are packed in a flight case with tailor-made foam and lace that is very usable for traveling later, of course. A lot of bubble wrap makes sure that even the flight case itself is protected before the set is shipped to its new owner. My lenses are ready now and I cannot believe in what a record time GL Optics put this together and they're absolutely marvelous. And I cannot thank GL Optics and the team enough. This is the team who actually did the jobs and thank you so, so much. It was great. Thank you, Nan, for having me. It was just a wild trip for me. Absolutely beautiful. I heard that Mr. Lee has something very special for us today. These are the original K35 lenses. And that gives us the opportunity to do an exact comparison, lens to lens, and I will show you right now. So, this is it. This old flight case contains the most expensive cine lenses that have been built in numbers, old or new. Congratulations, you are now a member of an exclusive club of people that actually saw original K35 and had the chance to examine them. These are practically the only vintage cine lenses that cover full frame and offer very shallow depth of field because of the high speed. If you want to learn more about the K35 and their relationship to the FD, please watch our episode Legendary Cine Lenses on a Budget with the Canon FD. Side by side, the rehoused FD are much larger than the K35. Of course, the GL rehousing suits modern standards. The K35 will use the same housing after they're done. The iris is nice and round at any stop and I count 15 blades. And now I'm going to bust the myth I echoed myself, that lens elements of the K35 and FD are virtually identical. Looking at the front element of the 55mm FD and the 55mm K35, you can clearly see that although both lenses have the same speed, the K35 front element is slightly bigger. Looking at the rear reveals that the FD have an additional, smaller fixed rear element. With the 85mm it looks different. The front element seems to be identical. Again, we have a smaller fixed rear element on top of the element you see on the K35. The 35mm is very different, of course. This is the GL Wide Angle Adapter Magic, as there has never been an FD 35mm with f1.2. Naturally, the added glass for the adapter makes the lens even larger and heavier than the 85mm. The 24mm K35 was already disassembled, so I can't give you a direct comparison. I would have loved to throw the K35 and the FD on a camera to give you some side-by-side -side images, but we didn't have the time or location to do that, and the unrehoused K35 didn't have a mount we could use. <coughs> While I'm on my long way back home, you might want to go on the journey to rehouse your precious lenses to CineDreams. If you're in the East, you can contact GL Optics headquarters directly and talk to experts Nangu and Li Cheng in China. If you're in the West, you can also go to GL Optics USA website cinemaglass.com. Here you get the decade plus long rehousing expertise of action director and DOP Avi Cohen and his US team of professional creatives. Avi and his team were an integral part of the production of this episode. Having been with GL for 13 years, being filmmakers themselves and being based in Los Angeles, they know exactly what you need and you can answer all your questions during US working hours. You will find links to all GL offices in the description. Of course, I ran out of breath before even reaching Guangzhou, so I hop on a plane back to Europe. I had an amazing and inspiring time in China and I would like to give my sincere thanks to all those who made this project possible. I would like to thank Mr. Gu or Mr. Li for inviting me to Chengdu, for all the trust that comes with such a production, for organizing my travels and shooting gear in China, as well as for their amazing hospitality. I would like to thank my lens dealer, Avi Cohen from GL Optics USA, for coming up with the project in the first place. Contact size. 
stay cool, my man. Oh shit, I'm blessed to have the Top Gear director <laughs> as my cameraman. You big boy. My man, just watch that FDF. That, that, that. I would like to thank Jonathan from GL Optics USA, Chinese DOP Ma and the whole crew for their super professional B-roll footage that you see all over this episode. You will find their social media contacts in the description. Thank you to Nick Hartmann, Lukas Teutenberg and Max von Stahl for helping behind and in front of the camera. Having you around is priceless. Thank you to The Marmalade for letting us work with your crew and your studios. If you have never been to China, maybe you should go. It is an experience that is really different to most places I have ever been to. Being on the other side of a cultural divide is a very healthy way to understand that we're all the same, just different. I am still stunned of the beauty of my set and how wonderful they work for me. They are true working horses for a DOP and real nice assets for a rental house. I hope you found this excursion into lens rehousing interesting and useful. If you want to get a quote for your lenses, I'll leave a couple of links in the description. Please give us a like if you think that we deserve one. This always helps with the algorithm. And we have a lot of interesting episodes to come. So if you're not subscribed yet, please do so. And we can give you notification too if you hit that button. We have a lot of interesting episodes for you to enjoy online already. If you want to know what we're working on, please follow us on Instagram. And if you want to talk to us, you can do that here in the comments or in our closed Facebook group. I'll put links to that in the description. If you want to collaborate yourself with the media division as a manufacturer or as a filmmaker, you can always drop us a line. Again, the contact information is in the description. Content like this is only possible with the help of our beloved members. At the release of this video, these were our Kubrick members. A51 Pictures, Ahmad Ghul, Andy Lin, Alex B, B Kelly, Ethan Hegel, Eugenia Triana, First Turning, Gary Farrow, H3 FF01, Hein Hütted, In53 Kidio, Jamie Wido, Jeff Mitchell, J. Riley Holt, Krasimir Knezovic, Lukas Merischke, Lu Zonghang, Malik Gabor, Maximilian Willett, Michael Heidecker, Miguel Villa, Misha Gerwish, Necron 1050, Nikolas Jakubik, Nick Martin, F Zero Camera, Ole Schreiter DOP, Pascal Despois, Feroz Dalal, Recraw Film and Television Equipment, Rob Yale, Robert Hollingsworth, Robert Schwiebert, S, RJ Permenter, Salva Sansano, Sam Wall, Sandro Murta, Scott Hennessy, Sebastian Rooks, Shibai Su, Skinny Kid, Srabble, Stefan Solström, Steve Welsh, The Black Douglas, Tony Vatimena, Filmmaker Colorist, VS, JT Mac User One. Thank you so much. This is for you. Of course, we love all our members and we are very, very grateful for your kindness and your support. If you want to become a member of the Media Division yourself, the button should be here somewhere. We have interesting perks for our members and if you're a Kubrick member, you can even get personal consultation. This is it for today. My name is Nicholas and I'm signing out with no delicious wishes. Shoot something amazing.